Hi, and welcome to the Beer Temple. I am Chris Quinn going solo today, and I think that's good because I don't really have any room on the table. Uh, this is the uh, third part in our series on sour beers. Uh, I think this might be the end. I had talked about going to three or four, but I'm not sure what I would do for a fourth. So uh, I figured I'd go out with a bang um, and just drink all these goozes in one episode. So um, no, that's not really going to happen, but uh, I was trying to figure out which uh, Gooses I wanted to have for this show. I figured, you know, like I mo said a moment ago, go out with a bang. So I brought up uh, a whole bunch, and I don't, I'm not one to really like brag about stuff, but I figured they're all up here. It's kind of cool. Um, so I figured I'd just kind of keep them on the show and uh, and have them as my kind of set decoration. So yeah, this is actually a big portion of my Goose collection, um, probably about half of it. Um, and pretty representative. A lot of what I have is, is probably doubles or triples of, of this stuff. So anyway, um, I'll just figured I would pull up a couple um, and talk about Goose, which is one of my favorite beer styles. It is a style of beer that pretty much contradicts every other style of beer there is. It is the most intriguing, interesting, unique, amazing style of beer in my mind. Uh, it is a Belgian style. So I only have <clears throat> Belgian examples here because it is a DOC. There's a domain or, or there's a control saying what is a goose and what isn't. So I only have true gooses here on the show today. So what is goose? Goose is uh, a style of um, spontaneously fermented beer. Um, and it is derived from blending lambics. So basically a lambic, uh, you may have had uh, one before, I had a couple on a previous show, is uh, most often uh, sweetened um, in, in America and Lindemann's, uh, which I have right here, is the most common lambic uh, that you get. And they're often sweetened with either uh, cherry or raspberry are the two most popular, but it could be anything. It can be banana or ap apricot or a whole bunch of stuff here. I've got one that's um, uh, red wine, I think, somewhere here. Yeah, there we go. Um, there's like a, a, a red wine grape or Cabernet grape, something on there. Um, so basically, a lambic is a beer that is um, 30 to 40, usually, percent wheat. Uh, the rest is barley, so it is a wheat beer, and it is brewed in a very, very long process. Um, typically, it takes them three or four or five, six hours just of, of boiling this stuff. They boil the hell out of it. Um, and they also hop it really, really aggressively, which might surprise you who've had Lambic or Goose before because it is not a bitter beer at all. Uh, the reason is because um, they age the hops at all. So I think I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. I'll get back to the hops. So they take this Lambic and they brew it and they hop it and they make you know beer out of it. And then instead of adding yeast to it, what they do is take this beer and they put it up into what they call a cool ship, which is generally a part of the brewery that is elevated above the other parts and kind of um, open on four sides potentially to the environment. And it's a shallow pan, well relatively shallow and very wide. So the beer has a lot of contact area and this is how they used to cool down beer uh, originally. Nowadays we just kind of send it through a heat exchanger and it cools it down really quick. And what they do is they put it up in this cool ship and they open up these little vents to just let the air kind of waft across it. And whatever yeasts happen to be floating in the air at the time land on the beer and start fermenting it. So it is a spontaneously wild fermented beer and that is Lambic. And what they then do is they put it in to oak containers, usually a cask, although it could be like a big sherry butt or a big fooder like we are talking on the Flanders Red show. And they let the beer age. Um, but that is Lambic. And what happens then is you can age it for you know, six months or a year or three years or four years or however want you, how long you want to um, age it in this oak and just kind of let it mature. Um, since there's a lot of these wild yeasts, they will continue to kind of ferment until these things become 
bone dry. A lot of, you know, these Brettanomyces yeast in there, a lot of um, bacteria, um, souring bacteria such as Pediococcus or Acetobacter, um, Lactobacillus, those are the three big ones. And what Guz then is, is unsweetened Lambic that is blended. So if you take Lambic and blend it and don't sweeten it, it basically makes a Guz. And getting back to the hops real quick, the reason that they hop it is hops are actually a natural antibacterial. So they hop the hell out of these things to make sure that it doesn't get too out of control. That's the same reason they don't brew these in the summer because the bacteria in the summer when it's hot out just would go ape over this beer um, and just it would become too wild, too funky. Um, so they brew them in the cooler months, they hop it, but they use aged hops because they don't want that big bright character from the hop or a lot of bitterness. They age the hops often up to three years to get rid of all of the bitterness and all of the uh, hop oils. So you don't really get any hop character, you just get the antibacterial qualities of the hops. Now they usually use maybe about I think I read five times as much hops as a typical, you know, Belgian ale would use. So they put a lot of hops in there. Um, so these people then blend their lambics. Uh, I think it has to be a blend of um, one, two, and three year old lambics at least with an average age of at least one year. So you can't just have a drop of three year, a drop of two year, and the rest, you know, young lambic and, and um, and let it go. No, um, it, it's got to have uh, some three-year uh, lambic in it. And um, the result is incredibly complex, incredibly earthy, bone dry. There is absolutely no residual sugars usually left in these things. Um, highly effervescent because this old lambic, which has no sugars left, is then blended with young. So the, the old lambics are full of these bugs that don't have any sugars to eat anymore, they put young lambic in it, they go crazy and they start fermenting it. So they do that in the bottle and it makes it quite effervescent. Um, I'm gonna get cracking here um, with um, one that I, I think doesn't get the respect that it deserves um, and is also easy to find. A lot of these gooses are, you know, very highly sought after, very hard to find and very pricey. And this one right here, isn't. So I figured why not start with that one. I also am going to teach you guys a little trick. If you haven't before, if you want to keep a, a bottle cap and you don't have my fancy top to bottom opener, just throw a quarter on there. Takes it right off and doesn't dent it at all for those who care. Can't use that one because it's also got a cork. A lot of these guys have corks in there. Um, and that's, I think, mainly because you can age these beers for a long, long time. Just the other day I had um, uh, a Guz that was um, about 25 years old and it still tasted fine. Um, so these things can get older, uh, can, can you know continue to mature and develop for years and decades. I don't have any on today's show that are too old, but um, yeah, uh, so what we have here is the Cuvée René from Lindemans. If you see this sitting next to the Framblois and you grabbed it by mistake, you might have been in for a shock. Uh, it is a true Guz, and it is a blend of one, two, and three-year-old unsweetened Lambics. And um, Lindemans is the biggest producer of Lambic by far in the world. Um, you can get it. I think this cost me about, oh, I forgot, man, you're going to have to wait for me to get the, the prices on these. I think $8.99, I think, uh, which is cheap for a goose and it also comes in a nice small glass. A little bit of this goes a long way. Uh, and they're also pretty low alcohol, 5 or 6% for a goose. So what am I getting here? Typically golden uh, colored beer. Uh, quite clear, although sometimes they can be cloudy as well. Uh, effervescent and the classic goose nose to it. So what am I getting here? Boy, oh man. So I am definitely getting earth driven qualities here. A ton of, I've said horse blanket before. This is like a wet sweaty horse blanket. All these things I'm gonna say are gonna be in a good way unless otherwise noted. You'll just have to trust me. Lemony, spritzy, like highly acidic lemon, lemon juice. Um, almost like, like a wet leather and just a funk, like a moldy funk 
to them as well. Sometimes they can get incredibly cheesy, like a strong cheese. This one isn't quite like that, but you're not getting any malt. You're not getting any hops. It is all the all the yeast character here. Okay. Gotta check the time. I have people coming over to help me drink these. <laughs> um, so, incredibly tart. Um, not incredibly tart, quite tart. Uh, very dry finish, no sweetness at all. Light bodied as well. A lot of kind of like a rocky quality to it or stony, almost like you're sucking on some like pebbles or something like that that have like the minerals or something in there. Um, incredibly funky for any normal beer. Um, it, this beer is not going to be a beer that's palatable for a lot of people, but to me, I just get a lovely like hay and earth and like barnyard. Um, so kind of funky, you know, like, uh, a, like a horse's stable, something like that, um, with nice hints of acidic lemon character to it. And also, um, I mean, really that's, there's just so much going on. Um, it finishes very, very long. Uh, it's not in this one isn't incredibly carbonated, but it does have a nice spritz on your palate as well. And it's quite good. Uh, I'm going to give this guy, uh, uh, I'm going to go 93. I'll go 93 because I don't know where I'm going to go from here. Quite a good beer. This is definitely the gateway goods. If you guys are interested in this style of beer and you've had the Flanders Reds, you've had some American Wilds, this is where to go next. This guy, the Cuvée Rene from Lindemann's. Um, yeah, that's that's the one to go to. So, um, one thing I didn't mention before is that it comes from a specific area in Brussels, Gooses. They come from the Seine Valley in the Peotenland, right around Brussels. In fact, the uh, Seine River, I think, runs right through the city, and that's where these natural yeasts that have been known to give the Goose their distinctive character were first discovered. Whoa, this guy's coming out already. All right, wow, I just saw, I started un, uh, undoing the cage and uh, the cork just started popping up. These are continuing to ferment. These are continuing to carbonate as they're bottled. So, you know, be careful when you're opening uh, bottle finished beers. So, um, this is, uh, I'm kind of losing my train of thought here. Um, this is the, uh, the old Boone the old Goose Boone. Uh, I wanted to have a Boone on here because uh, Frank Boone is considered a master blender of Goose and lam of Lambics, I should say. Um, he originally started out just blending, but quickly kind of moved to brewing his own Lambics as well. And he's really a big proponent for doing things the traditional way. Um, these beers were very much endangered for a while, and now it'd be hard to believe that with how hard they are to acquire at times. But um, yeah, Boone, they are from uh, obviously um, uh, Belgium. Uh, I, I mean, right around the Brussels area. That's uh, Lambique, Lambique, Belgium. So Lambique, Lambic, that's probably where the beer gets its name. And uh, this is his traditional, uh, or his standard, um, Oud Goose. And if any Goose says Oud on it, uh, that means that it is completely uh, unsweetened, unpasteurized, unfiltered, all that stuff, um, and that it's the real deal. Um, you can see how much carbonation it is. I mean, that tiny little pour I have, and it's half carbonation. Very typical of a Goose. In fact, I was surprised that the Cuvée Rene was a little bit more still than that. Not still, but not highly effervescent like this. So, uh, let's give the Abun Goose a sniff. Uh, a similar color to it. Uh, again, you're going to get a fairly clear um, golden copper color. Not copper, but uh, straw and gold. Easy there, man. Just chill. And uh, 
much more subtle, much more, um, I don't wanna say elegant, but restrained flavors here. I'm really having to kind of dig down and kind of pull them up where this, the Cuvée Rene was a little bit more in my face. I'm getting floral notes as well as lemon, maybe like a lemon blossom if that exists. Um, kind of earthy greens. Um, a little bit of like, kind of like a, a wet, like algae or rockiness to it as well. And a little bit of just straight up like dirt, like dirt and funk underneath it as well. Um, yeah, I mean, more tame, but also a ton going on. And it's actually maybe a little bit funkier than the Cuvée Rene, but just, it's really kind of mellowed out in there. Um, this is, well, Best Buy 2030. Oh, that's the other thing. Uh, when I say it defies so much of what other, the conventions of beer, you know, you don't want your beers to spoil, except for this beer. It's all about how it spoils in a way. Um, you know, uh, you should drink your be highly hopped beer, but with no hop character. Um, they are low alcohol, yet you can age them forever. And uh, this is good until it says 2030, and I'm sure it could easily go there and maybe even further. Uh, I'm not ye uh, sure what year this was brewed, but um, yeah. Give a sip. Mm. even lighter on the palate than the Cuvée Rene. Very spritzy as well. Um, it's got a very intense minerality to it. And definitely that lemon, like a rocky lemon. Also that kind of horsey flavor, but much lighter, much easier to drink much more kind of well put together, I feel. Um, I would love to have this with a cheese plate, some really stinky stuff to kind of play off it. Um, really just a delicious beer. Um, and again, you're getting the Brettanomyces, you're getting the Lacto and the PDO, but I feel that it's just a little bit more restrained here. And it's just allowing them the, for you to kind of delve into it more and pull a little bit more out of it. Um, I'm getting a bit of like stone fruit in there as well, maybe like an apricot. And um, really just, really just nice. Maybe I'll have a tiny sip more. Easy there, Maxie. Chill out there, dog. Hey, hey, come on, chill out. One sec, guys, my dog's freaking. All is well in maxi world again. Um, so where was I with these gooses? Um, just a really wonderful take on, on the style by Frank uh, Boone. And uh, I like this one uh, quite a bit more than the Cuvée Rene. I'm gonna go 95 with it. I just think it's more restrained. I think it's easier to drink and I still think it has all the qualities of a goose that you would want uh, to have in there um, without it kind of having a lot of that really nasty funk, which some people love. I mean, some people want it the more the better. If it tastes like a dirty diaper, awesome that's what i want uh not me you know not necessarily anyway uh great acidity great tartness um without it being you know undrinkable so to speak so the next uh is uh from another pretty well known and acclaimed uh goose blender uh dry uh, also from uh, belgium obviously i'm a little bit nervous about these they have been sitting in my cellar for quite a while and yeah it's already starting to come out so let's just see yeah it's just Coming right out. All right, no gushers though, which is good. Um, so Dreifentinen, uh, Armand is the master blender at Dreifentinen, and he also started simply blending and then went into brewing his own lambic. I believe now he's back to blending after a fire. Um, he's had a couple of catastrophes at his brewery. 
I think a cooler or a heater or something went haywire and he lost a whole bunch of his beer. But um, these are very highly sought after in general. And um, this is a blend of one, two, and three year old Lambics. I'm just trying to see if there's any date on it. Uh, oh, so not that old, uh, 2010, uh, December 1, 2010. We're now, you know, midway through 2012. So by good standards, that is a pretty fresh. And again, what you would expect to see, a ton of frothy white foam on there. A little bit lighter than the preceding, but again, a nice, brilliant, um, golden-hued beer. Very, very pretty beer here. I'm running out of room for all these. So This, to me, has dry fontainen all the way. If you get to drink enough of these, you definitely pick up on the house character because these places, these breweries, have house character. Whatever kind of microflora uh, have kind of come to live in the brewery affect the beer. And so much so that these brewers really don't want to disturb them. They don't do a whole lot of cleaning um, and they don't want to mess with anything because they don't want to affect their beer. In fact, Margaret and I went to um, Cantillon and uh, there were cobwebs and stuff all over the place. I have a couple photos that I'll put up for you guys. But it, they really are very serious about keeping their house character in their beers. And a big part of that is using the same barrels over and over again because they get inoculated with those bugs and just letting you know the walls and the ceilings and everything be. In fact, when Lindemann's um, moved breweries, they took down a big piece of the, of the wall uh, uh, of the brewery and a bunch of the wooden beams and move them into the new brewery and just kind of set them up and put the beams up just to kind of make sure that they're keeping the house character. Um, anyway, uh, the house character of a dry fine Dreyfontein, and especially the younger ones, is burnt rubber. Um, I get a lot of burnt rubber and it tends to mellow out as their beers get a little bit older. Um, and certain years have more. Uh, very much like with wines, there are vintages of uh, they're of goods, of, of lambic, I should say, because depending on what the weather was like, how hot it was, how cold it was, um, you know, can really affect uh, what barrel it was in, I guess. Uh, wouldn't really be a vintage thing then, uh, but it can affect the beer from year to year. So I'm getting a lot of that kind of musty, moldy, dusty quality to it, like a cellar or, or, or an attic in the summer. And burnt rubber uh, in there. Not nearly as much lemon or kind of stone fruit in there, but or uh, pitted fruit, but I am getting a lot of stone and minerality, rubber, dust. I can tell that there's going to be some tartness as well, kind of an acetic character. Yeah, and you know, maybe a hint of just like a floral note, just a hint, but it's really kind of underneath all that kind of grime and dust. Mm. Mm. Man, that's good. The most acidic by far of the three that we've had. I mean, lemon juice is what you're getting here. Um, lemon juice, like I was switching on lemon juice with some sort of like um, peach pit in my mouth as well. That kind of like stony or cherry pit, something like that in there as well. Um, the, the burnt rubber is not as apparent on the palate, um, which is fine if, if, it, if it was. Um, but this is a kind of a, a little bit more of a, a sock in the face. Um, definitely would want some cheese or some food with this guy. Very soft as well, surprisingly soft. Um, the carbonation isn't really kind of you know attacking you, although it's certainly there. And yeah, really just kind of lovely. I'm gonna say peach pit and lemon with some stone and just that big kind of musty dustiness as well. Um, 
I'll put this right in between these guys, these two. I'm gonna go 94. Um, I really, really like this beer, and I'm really kind of splitting hairs here. Um, and on a different day, I could have these in a different order. Um, just a really, really lovely beer. If you do have the means uh, to get some dry uh definitely check them out just for their kind of unique take on the style. Um, and again, Armand is one of the big proponents and one of the big players in, uh, you know, kind of these traditional methods for brewing uh, Lambic and, and Goose blending. So three down, one to go. I've done all three bottles and I, I, I could stop there and I was going to stop there, but everybody's going to want to see the Cantillon. So I have a Cantillon. Uh, I'm almost saying it like regretfully. No, Cantillon's awesome. Like I mentioned before, uh, we visited them uh, in the past, and it's great. I mean, their brewery is right in downtown Brussels. You'd be amazed. It's kind of like in a seedy area as well. Uh, we had just the, the, the best tour. Um, Jean Venois, or Roy, however you want to say his name. Ooh, some goose got through, through the cork here. Hold on a sec. Got a visitor. All right, so I did have a couple of visitors. I told you I was having people over and I wasn't fast enough. So they're off watching, enjoying uh, the, uh, well, the three that we just had. So as I was saying about Cantillon, uh, I noticed that I took the cap off and there's like syrup or goop. At first I thought it was beer, but it's like kind of goopy so we'll see what that means um cantillon you know i was gonna say was i wasn't going to do it because it was a big bottle on the show but everybody who was telling me which ones they wanted to see everybody wanted to see the uh the cantillon it's kind of got this cachet to it and a lot of people wanted uh this one the fufoon but i was just going to do an unfruited goose show today so i didn't do it um, to be honest, I also think this year's Fafoon is a little lackluster, so I want to sit on it and see what, what happens. This does not want to come out at all. In fact, I just chipped the bottle. Man, this could end in serious tears. There we go. So, Cantillon, like I said, right in Brussels. Uh, no gushing, that's good. Um, and the uh, the master blender and brewer, uh, Jean Van Waugh, Jean Van Roy, um, is there. Oh, I'm getting some weird smells here. Um, and they are also kind of a, a living museum to Lambic. So you go there, and those are some of the pictures I'll show. Just cobwebs all over the place, right in the middle of kind of a, kind of a nasty part of Brussels. Um, and it's really archaic there. I mean, their bottling line is pretty much lower tech than a startup brewery in America would ever see. In fact, I saw a guy filling a quarter barrel of Cantillon with just a siphon by hand. I walked by and they're like, oh yeah, we're filling the kegs here. And I've never seen it not in a machine. It was just a guy with a siphon out of a cask. And he just kind of looked up at me. It was like, uh, you know, didn't speak English and kind of kept doing his work. So really kind of old and rustic. Um, Cantillon's also, more than any other um, producer of Guz or Lambic, is experimental. They do kind of vintage blends called uh, Lou Pepe. They also do um, different types of barrels. So red wine, white wine, using red wine grapes or white wine grapes or peach. Um, in addition to just the, the cherry and the, the raspberry. So uh, they've also become almost impossible to get. It, it's kind of disappointing. Uh, they are good, uh, but the thing is, uh, so are a lot of other gozes as well. So um, here we go, let's take a look at it. Um, you know, pretty much like the other guys, uh, kind of like a, a golden straw color, big frothy head. Uh, I'm gonna dip my nose in here, but Oh, it's not as bad as I thought. So it's got like a really interesting like port, tawny port character on the on the bottle. You guys are gonna have to smell this bottle. Uh, so I was nervous, but th it smells fine in the in the actual glass. Um, a little bit of kind of that dry fontine and burnt rubber quality to it. Um, Cantillon very much has their house character as well. 
um, and I'm getting a lot of, I, I always say like rocks, um, earthy rocks, definitely the horse blanket, um, and not quite as much lemon as I was getting from the Boone. More aggressive than the Boone as well, more in line with the, the Dreyfantinen. <sighs> But, you know, good smelling beer. So, that's interesting. It reminds me kind of a cross between the Dreyfantinen and the Boon. It has a lot of that lemon flavor and a lot of that stone fruit, and it has quite a bit of acidity, but not as much as uh, the Dreyfantinen. Um, I like it a lot. It's a little bit more restrained, not quite that big sock in the face. Still quite drinkable, epically complex. And just really <clears throat> a lot, a lot going on. Very soft, it is quite carbonated, but still has uh, a nice soft flavor to it. It doesn't taste like kind of, um, you know, bitter or stinging from the, from the carbonic acid at all. And really just a, a lovely drink. I, I'm gonna say I like it as much as the Boone. Uh, I'm gonna go 95 for this guy. I mean, these are all awesome beers. I think you guys are getting it. And it comes down to a matter of, of preference. Like I said before, easy there, Maxie. What an ass. Um, you know, any given day, you know, any given bottle. I mean, I was talking about, you know, differences in vintage. You get differences in bottle here big time because they've just been, it's just a wild beer, uh, literally. So, um, yeah, I'm going to go 95 with this. Um, and I think that about does it. I'm going to try to rush through the ending a little bit. I apologize, but I do have people, guests waiting. Uh, although they're waiting and drinking good goose, so... They're not here for me, so I guess I shouldn't feel that bad. Um, tell me what you guys thought of this show. If you want to see and you know me do some more uh, beers about goose, or are you all goosed out now? Any more sours? Um, and that's about it. Keep the comments coming, uh, and thanks again for all the likes on, uh, on Facebook and, and iTunes. And uh, that's about it. Um, I, I mean this quite literally this time. I've got some good beers to go drink, and hopefully you do too. Some good uh, spontaneously fermented lambic gizzes.